everyone, welcome back to the Cookbook Kitchen, um, Kitchen Conversations, and we have a very esteemed guest, Julianne Lennox, um, the Chief Executive Officer of Frank and Pom Pomeray Monopole Group, but we are here primarily to talk about the Louis Pomeray. And first of all, and I have to say to you, congratulations, because your company was the first company to produce um, the first house to produce a sparkling wine in the UK. Indeed, the first champagne house, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So tell me, why did you make this brave step? That's a, that's a very good and, and, and quite broad question. Um, so it's, it started a few years ago, probably six, seven years ago, in, in, our, in our president and chairman, uh, Mr. Brunkin. Uh, in, in his mind, he, he had a few discussions with, uh, with um, the Pomeri Cellar Master uh, and, and back in the days, uh, our vineyard director called Clément Pierlot um, about wine growing in the UK and in other regions, actually in other regions in the world. So we were looking at, at you know, other regions where we could produce a traditional method sparkling wine. Uh, still in, in a reasonably high um, quality. So the goal was not to produce sparkling wine, to produce sparkling wine. It was just, it, it was basically to produce a sparkling wine that would maybe not compete entirely with champagne, but at least reach the top of its category outside of the, outside of the champagne um, area, basically. So the goal is really to produce the best, best uh, traditional meter sparkling wine possible. And after a few analyses of different wine producing regions around the world, um, they found an amazing, an amazing piece of land in Hampshire. Um, and they started, to, they started to look around them and, and see what was done back in, the, back in the time. It was probably in 2014, 2015. Um, and they started to, to taste different English sparkling wines, uh, starting to do uh, soil analysis, and, and, and basically they found out that, you know, the, the soil is amazing. Um, the quality of the grapes uh, produced back in the days was already amazing and is improving year on year since then. Um, and, and that's how the story started. And they've been presented, they've been presented a, a piece of land, a piece of land in, in Amsha called Fingerstone, near a small village called Alsfort. Uh, and and they found in love. They found in love with that. So uh, the, the the yeah the, the land is amazing. We've got an amazing view, amazing um, landscape, perfect for the for the viticulture. Great sun exposition, um, and that's that's how we started. Mr. Brunkin said back back then, oh, look, that's that's where I want to be, and that's that's the piece that's the piece of land I would buy. You. I don't know how long ago, but there was a case where we have got the same structure of um, Indeed. the the soil, which is the Indeed. so it's exactly it's the same piece of land that comes from Champagne or from the UK, depending where you where you want to start. Uh, but it's exactly the same piece of land that comes from the south of England and that goes into uh, into Champagne with a very chalky, very dry and and tough, basically a uh, soil. Which is perfect for the for the, um, yes. the cultivation of, of of vines and especially the three the three um, grape varieties and the, the, the three type of wine of, of of vines that we mainly use in Champagne, which are Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Meunier. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's how we started as well uh, within the within the soil analysis we've done. Yeah. Because the British, there was a bit of a battle for us to be able to call it champagne, wasn't there? But we lost the case. Um, so that's why you very yeah. cleverly, cleverly, I think, use your name Pomeray, because everyone knows that Pomeray is a champagne house. Indeed. So, well, the, the, the goal was not to use it, to use the, the, the sole Pomeray name as it stands, uh, just to avoid confusion, of course. But at the same time, the goal was to make a, a proper link between our activities in Champagne, the knowledge, the know-how, and the expertise from the Champagne house we are, uh, and at the same time explain that this is a, basically a transfer of all of this 
uh, expertise into uh, the the UK uh, the UK wine producing. Um, well, I have, I have to say we welcome you because. <laughs> Um, well, it's fantastic, I think, and, and the wine creation that's going on or viticulture that's going on in the UK is growing. Um, I think with our soil, we do have good soil, and with global warming, we have better weather, and so you can get the right sweetnesses of the grapes, can't you? Completely. So that, that was as well, this, you know, this, probably the second or the third part of the reflection back then. So, of course, it's, it's all about uh, falling in love with a with a with a land and with a specific place uh, first, but then you need you need a bit of you know you need a bit of certainty around the the wine that you the wine and the grapes that you will produce uh, on that land. So first, as I say, the soil analysis were amazing. We found out that we were on the same piece of chalk, um, but as well we decided to make a bet on, on the future and, and, and the bet is definitely on the, on, on the weather evolution, basically, and on the global warming. Uh, it's, it's quite unfortunate to say that global warming is happening, but unfortunately it's a fact at the moment. Uh, and, and we all believe in, in the, the British wine community that definitely um, we, we're going to something uh, Probably slightly sweeter as well in terms of, of grapes. We'll have different uh, we'll have different acidity levels over the next few years. Uh, we we already see that you know the temperature in in the zone where we produce the area where we produce the grapes has evolved quite uh, strongly over the last five to ten years and will continue to evolve. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, definitely the change the change the climate change is is definitely something that made that was part of the of the of our reflection back then because you released Louis Pomeroy in two thousand and eighteen and that um, two thousand and seventeen sorry yeah. no, 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 no. thrown in the Hattingley Valley in Hampshire, but you've now actually put down your own vines, haven't you? So yeah, so actually, what we started, we started the two projects at the same time. We wanted to plant vines, but we wanted to start as well selling our own products. Um, so we started planting the vines in 2017. Indeed, we bought the land in 2016, um, and we're still buying land at the moment. Um, try, we were we're trying to. Uh, let's say grow uh, responsibly the the scale of the operations we have in the UK at the moment, uh, and and next to that the, we decided to to start producing uh, to start producing a a, a first uh, a first cuvee in the UK. So how we did it is through a, a, a partnership with uh, with Atingley Valley um, and and their one their, their winery over there. So basically we buy grapes as we do in Champagne. So as you know, in Champagne, of course we own land, we own vineyards, but we need to buy grapes as the, the region of Champagne is owned by lots of different and small wine growers uh, next to the big houses as we are. Uh, but we did the same in the UK. We bought grapes from various um, growers, uh, mainly from the Amsha region. Um, and we use the, the winery of Fattingly to produce our, our first uh, cuvee with the team of Champagne Pomery coming over to the UK and giving all the, its, its wine expertise and its, its advices on how the, 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 the wine should, should be created, basically. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And I have to say, um, so Fiona um, Beckett, who goes under the name of Food Writer, she yeah. wrote, um, the standard of English sparkling wine is high, but I can't remember being impressed by a homegrown sparkling wine for a while, as I am by this bottle. 
which is a very nice quote. And everywhere I what can I say? (laughs) Cheers. Um, Everywhere I look, people are saying it's very, very nice. It's a very good wine. You did just mention sweet. Now, do you think we as Brits like sweet sparkling wine? No, I I mentioned sweet not in the taste of the wine, but sweet in the taste of the grapes. Okay. So uh, with the global warming and the fact that the temperature will go up, Hopefully, probably uh, the temperature, the, the weather will be slightly drier in the UK than it is at the moment. Uh, this, with a, a slightly bigger sun exposition, um, will of course uh, we'll be play on, on the on the taste profile of the grapes, basically. But not we're not talking about the, the wine in itself, definitely not. And and indeed, the UK consumers are not attracted or not necessarily attracted uh, by, by sweeter styles, definitely not. And, uh, and, and it actually took us, it, it can take us back uh, through, through the beginning of, of, of Pomery history, the Champagne House, where Madame Pomery, which is one of the leading women from, from the Champagne region, uh, created uh, and released and commercialized the first uh, brute nature of champagne back in 1874. Uh, and and it, her, her target market for that drier style of champagne was the United Kingdom. So, you know, that's, it, it, take, it takes us back then in the 19th century where the, 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 you know, the appreciated style of, of sparkling wine and of champagne back then by the British consumers was already a drier style and definitely not a, a sweeter one. Yeah, no, no, because um, I don't think yeah, we yeah. sweet. But no, sorry, I'm confused that you wait for the grapes to reach a certain sweetness before you pick them and do the Vendant. Indeed, indeed. So at the moment, at the moment, the, the, the harvest uh, in the UK are generally done in, in October. Okay. Uh, the second part of October, when, when in Champagne, for example, is uh, the, it, it is much earlier in the season and generally uh, early early September. But now, since a few years, it, it, we we've seen that through the global warming again, um, the harvest start generally a bit earlier than 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 in the past, and it can even start at the end of August. Yeah, it's um, a whole science, isn't it? Growing grapes and making champagne. Is. And is, yeah. sort of praying to the weather at the same time. Yeah, indeed. So we need a lot of sun. We need a bit of rain at some point, but not too much rain to avoid the diseases. Uh, and, and we need a, 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 good, a good sunny August for in Champagne. But in the UK, we need a good sunny September to get the best and the biggest grapes in October when we will harvest them. And how many bottles do you make out of in the UK? So at the moment, it's a very, very tiny production. We produce approximately 25,000 bottles annually. Okay. The first vintage we've released was the 2014. Yeah. Uh, that, we, that we released uh, in Australia mainly. And the first we've broadly released in the UK is the one we have at the moment. The, it's, it's of course non-vintage, but it's 99.9% of the same uh, year. It's the 2016 base. Okay. So we're building now, as it's, as it's, uh, as it's the start of a, of, a, of a story, basically. We're building yeah. reserve wine, as we do in Champagne, but it takes time, obviously. So we've built reserve wine from the 2014, 2015, and, uh, and now 2016 uh, uh, vintage base, basically. And... Uh, from the 2017 onwards, we're using slightly more reserve wine to get to get a consistency uh, in our wines, basically. Okay, and can I just talk to you? I've not tried it myself. So um, we'll have to to try it. Well, but I, I was reading. People say green apples, fresh lemon and lime, a honey stoned fruit, um, with beautiful integrated bubbles. It's elegant with a mineral finish. Mm-hmm. Does that sound about right to you, or would you like it to does. something else? It does, but at the same time, let, let me tell you something, the taster is always right. <laughs> so 
So, you know, I can't force anyone to tell anything about our wines. It's just, you know, when you taste a wine, when you taste a sparkling wine, it always comes from, it always comes from the heart. Yeah, so it's personal. And each I person. Think, yeah. So I can't force them to tell any sweet or kind word about us, but I'm, I'm, uh, we receive them so thankfully and we're, we're really, really uh, happy and, and, and proud about the first comments we've received about, you know, the, the, the latest release from, from Louis from England. And uh, we look forward to um, letting the British consumers and, and the different uh, Connoisseurs taste the new vintage next release, which will be uh, uh, the non vintage, of course, but with a 2017 base. Um, so, that's, so that's that's it basically. But, but indeed, in terms of tasting notes, we, we, we do agree with what you've said, and it, it just comes, I guess, with the blend we are, uh, we are using um, in this mine with the majority of Chardonnay. Uh, and, and afterwards, a uh, reasonable proportion of Pinot Noir and a very, very tiny, uh, a, a slight touch, basically, of Meunier. Okay. So all the citrusy apple notes definitely come from, uh, from the, the Chardonnay majority. Lovely. You've already won a gold award at the Global Sparkling Masters. Yes, we did. Yeah, well, that's... Yes. So proud, so happy about that. So you know, it's it's the first first uh, release we've broadly uh, sent to wine journalists, to you know, would it be bloggers, judges, or or awards all over all over the UK and 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 the world basically. And we've received amazing comments about about the wine, and we're so happy for that. Um, so now we've got a we've got a big responsibility to to keep on producing good wines um, and to keep on proposing uh, high qualitative um, yeah. wines. Basically. How much is it roughly a bottle? It's it's around it's it's around thirty four thirty five to forty pounds retail. Because that's quite expensive. It is indeed. Uh, but rarity it, is expensive, isn't it? Okay, yeah, no, rarity, and that's what you're based on, and you have got some amazing reviews. I just wanted to, so people could know. Um, oh, yeah, it is. It's worth trying, and it's it worth supporting Britain. Uh, well, I can just encourage people to, to try it, and, and then send us or, or send the, the people they've bought it from uh, their opinion, feedback on the wine. Um, Obviously, it's 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 a premium wine, pricing wise. Uh, we have to admit it. But of course, rarity is 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 an explanation. But at the same time, uh, the let's say the expertise of the Champagne House, uh, the fact that you know we age the wine sufficiently long before releasing it on the market, uh, is another explanation. We're not releasing wines and and our wines. Uh, as early as as we would be allowed to do it, because there are no huge re regulation in 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 the in the UK or the British wine uh, category at the moment. Uh, but we are we are trying to uh, base ourselves as much as we can on the Champagne regulation, so that we are sure that what we offer to the to the consumers is something really really qualitative. No, that sounds fantastic. Can I just ask you about the Vendage? Now, in France, in the Champagne region, the Vendage is a very merry occasion for all the youngsters and foreigners who go yeah. there. So who picks your grapes in the Vendage in the UK? So in the UK, we've got local uh, teams that, who are hired by the, by the vineyard managers. So we've got different, obviously, different um, different uh, British employees that are uh, involved in, in, in our viticulture in the UK and they're all year long trying to build friends team or, or people they know uh, uh, and, and trying to build these teams in order to plan the, to plan the, the vendange or, or the harvest and we've got obviously as well people coming over from France who are um, helping them for the vendange but as well for the pressing uh, of of the grapes to simply be sure that we are following uh, 
let's say the quality the quality guidelines uh, from from the group from the house and, and the group basically. Yeah, and does everyone stay on site at the Bondage or do they go back to their homes because they're all more local? Or do it you really it really depends. It really depends. We've got both people coming with uh, uh, mobile homes, uh, yeah. you know, motor homes. Uh, and, and others who stay at, at friends or around the, around the, the barns, in the barns around the, around the vineyard. So it really depends. And it depends obviously on, on, on where these people come from. Um, we'll have obviously uh, this year slightly different uh, health and safety measures. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> so we, we, still, we, we still don't know how, how, how the next harvest will be organized. We still have to use Two meters apart. That's yeah, all. They and need. Uh, what the government measures will be, what the, well, we will see. We will see. Uh, so, so this this uh, next harvest will be a, will be a premiere uh, for us. We'll we'll see. We'll see how we can organize it. But uh, yeah, normally it's 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 uh, it's done in a pretty pretty friendly way as we do in Champagne. But but at the same time, this this harvest will be the first big harvest for the vineyard because we. So the, the vineyard is, is um, we've got 40 hectares in the UK. Uh, 40 hectares, it's, it's a bit, let's, let's say we've got two different sites. We've got a big site of 40 hectares called Pingerstone, which is, which is the, the, the site I've mentioned earlier in, in the interview. Uh, on, on this 40 hectare sites, we've planted uh, 30 hectares. Uh, and we've, we've bought a second site called Lovington uh, with another 10 hectares. And these other 10 hectares uh, will be planted next year because we had to we had to cancel the planta the plantation which was planned uh, in in March April this year. Oh. So yeah, it's 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 postponed by a year unfortunately. But we the the first the first side finger zone will be harvestable as we as we say uh, from from this year on a on a bigger scale. So we haven't had a big a big vendange a big harvest yet. Uh, because we we were still in you know in in the in the first years uh, after the planting, so we needed a bit of time before harvesting properly the the vines, and yeah. being able to use the grapes not to not to do it uh, too early, okay. And therefore, not to damage the not to damage the vines. Was it named after our young royal, or it was named before him? It was named before, but we're very happy it, we're very happy about the about the name we've chosen. <laughs> Uh, so actually, the, the name is the name of the of Pomerie Champagne House founder. So uh, Louis Pomerie is, is a is a guy who has been forgotten basically in the history uh, because his wife took over the business after his death. Uh, he died basically two years after buying uh, after buying the Champagne House, which was called Champagne Grenot back in the days. Uh, Champagne, Champagne Grenot uh, was founded by Mr. Grenot basically um, in 1836 and a few years afterwards Mr. Grenot went bankrupt and needed a partner and that partner was Mr. Pomery. So they created together the house Champagne Pomery and Grenot Lovely. and unfortunately two years after, after his basically joint venture or his, his, his uh, purchase of, of Mr. Grenot's activity Ms., Mr. Pomery died. And his wife, uh, Mrs. Pomery, took over the business and developed the business into what is Champagne Pomery uh, nowadays, which is an international champagne house. And she's the one who, through her travels, um, noticed that the British taste, uh, we're coming back there, uh, the British taste was slightly uh, going through a, a, a drier style. So she was the one who commercialized a broadly and internationally uh, a, a, brut, a brut nature style of champagne. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the whole history about Pomery, but we're always talking about Madame Pomery, uh, and we're always forgetting um, um, Mr. Pomery, basically. So that's why we wanted to kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, Get to him. Remind, a, a small heart to him and, and remind him in, in the global history of the house. So that's why we call it Louis Pomery England. No, it's lovely. Because you also make Louis Pomery California, don't you? 
indeed we do uh, in in the napa valley so we started both projects similarly basically in 2015 16 that's when the first ideas uh, and the, yeah the, the first project started and, and came to life um, but two different projects basically the the uk being a uh, much more confidential one, much smaller one. Uh, obviously, we only produce 25,000 bottles and, and at, at the moment, and the goal is not to be uh, a huge, a huge, um, you know, a huge English wine producer. What we want to do is to, to continue to produce high qualitative wines and very, very specific and confidential premium wines, basically. In the US, it's a slightly different uh, operation, different idea. You know, the, the country is very different to the UK as well. Uh, so obviously in the US, uh, well, uh, even for us as a, as a French company, uh, you know, uh, the, the way we treat those projects is completely different. Uh, so the US is much more on a, on a slightly larger scale. Um, and, and that's it, it fits much better to the US market and it fits much better to the US mindset as well. Uh, because they, as, as you know, and, and through again, uh, the, the recent and the current history and especially on the political side, they, they like it big. They like, you know, they like big like businesses. They like it, it big. They like it. it. To, exactly. It needs to be big, it needs to be slightly larger um, than, than what we do in the UK, where we, we know the British consumers and, and as well the global consumers love English products, but they love premium English products. And that's what we wanted to, that's what I we wanted to like what you're saying, you're saying we're rather elegant and have a lot of taste. I do, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the UK has always been the first champagne market after France, so it says a lot. Uh, to the to to the British people and, and, and you know about the British people and about the, the British consumers. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, That's definitely. Really, can I ask you? Do you drink your champagne out of a flute or a coupe? Uh, none of none of the two. Basically, we use yeah we use a. If if I had to give you an advice on on the perfect style of of glass to to choose, it would be a white burgundy glass, something slightly larger than a flute, uh, and and slightly more restrained on the top than a, than a coupe, basically. So you've got you know a bit of both, but but none of them at the same time. Um, so yeah, we we need some a white wine glass is something like is is the perfect uh, glass shape. Wow. Or sparkling wine, yeah, definitely. And 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 if we want to go any further for rosé champagne or rosé English sparkling wine, we would we would recommend something even larger than than a white burgundy glass, because the aromas need space to develop themselves, and they need space to when you smell the wine. In a, in a flute, you can't smell the wine. You can't smell the aromas. You can't properly smell it. Can't in smell a, it. In the, in the coupe, you, you can smell it, but it goes away very quickly and you lose a bit of the aroma. So that's why with a, with a slightly larger scale and something slightly more refrain on the top, yep. gives you more space at the bottom to turn the wine in the glass and, and, and get all the aromas, but the aromas are, are then moving up and concentrated in a slightly thinner space that you can smell. Burst around the, those. I'm looking around it, but I can't find a, I can't find a, can't, is this a new sort of glass that champagne houses have decided to start drinking out of, or have the French been drinking out of this for years? No, no, no. It's it's been like that for years. I mean, it's been recommended by champagne houses and not only us, but but all the houses. Why do we the, get flutes then when we go to a restaurant? The the flutes is just for one thing, just just for the consumers to see the bubbles. I think it's all about that. It's nice to see bubbles going up, and and coming to the to the surface, isn't it? Yeah. But that's the only thing on a on a very on a very uh, you know. Uh, qualitative thing and if you want to have a proper wine tasting basically that's definitely not what you should use but it's probably 
slightly nicer. I don't know. I, I find white burgundy glass is amazing as well. So I would go oh, and try it for that. You got me. I'm going shopping. And can I ask you one last question? Should we open it with a pop or should it be open silently? Silently. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely silently. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It must make your heart drop when you see the motorbike, um, the motor car races for Formula One, just spraying it all over. Well, it's a different purpose, isn't it? <laughs> okay. At the same time, you know, uh, it's, of course, uh, you know, it's not the way we should drink it, definitely not. But at the same time, it's amazing to see that Champagne and hopefully tomorrow, uh, English sparkling wine are associated with celebration with you know joy great moments of life and you know we we know one we nobody to tell anyone what they have to do so at the same time it's amazing to see that they use champagne instead of beer or use champagne instead of something else yeah definitely so you know as the purpose the podium is not necessarily to to drink properly the, the champagne we find with that yeah well, listen, um, so from the 20th to the 28th, it's um, English Wine Week. So yeah. I recommend you to celebrate and go and buy a bottle of Louis Pomeray and enjoy it. You've heard all the talk about it um, from the man who's at the top and um, has shared some really insightful information. And um, I'm going to go to the vineyard and take a look. When this to, you, you're more than welcome to join us and, and to visit the vineyards as well as your, your listeners and, and, and viewers and, and friends. Uh, you know, something we haven't really talked about, and uh, I'll, I'll just make a small point about that because I think it's important, despite being in, in still rough uh, wine growing, uh, vine growing condition and viticulture condition compared to what we have in, in Champagne. At the moment, the philosophy and, and, and we think it's, it's appreciated and, and used by a lot of other uh, wine growers in the UK. Uh, our philosophy is, is, is to use uh, and, and to cultivate the vines uh, the most environmentally friendly we can the most sustainable we can and at the moment uh, since since the planting a few years ago uh, in 2017 we haven't used any chemical products yet uh, the goal is not to be 100 percent organic because we know we can't be or we know we won't be able to be organic because at some point when the weather won't be that as amazing as it's been over the last few weeks uh, one year in in our history would it be this year next year or the years after uh, we'll have a very, very wet year, unfortunately, with a lot of sun afterwards and therefore diseases that would come to, to the vines. So we know we will have to treat the vines at some point, maybe, maybe not. If we have to, we will do it. But the philosophy is definitely an organic philosophy we are, uh, we are you know, uh, into and, and, and definitely following as we are following in the rest of the wine producing regions we have vineyards in and we are um, you know, active in. But, but definitely in the UK, something that is, I think, amazing for me, and that is something that you will see if you come and, and visit us, is the fact that we are sustainable and really environmentally friendly with a lot of, um, you know, with a lot of trees and plants and flowers that we have planted ourselves in the vineyards just to keep uh, you know, the fauna and the flora going as, as if, you know, the vineyards was always part of it, was always part of the region. And, and you know, that's the philosophy around that. We've, we are very happy and, and proud to make a great wine based on the, on the comments you've given me. Uh, but at the same time, what we are even prouder of is to be, you know, sustainable, really to have a, a proper dedication to the environment and to what how the way we cultivate the vines in the UK but as well in, in the other regions we are, yeah. we are active in. That's brilliant to hear. And do you have a tasting room down there where people can taste not or not? Yet. We're still we're still we're still uh, finalizing the the project of you know building a proper site. But we've got amazing, amazing people working in the vineyards who are always delighted to welcome uh, any guests 
anyone willing to visit what we do. Uh, so you, you're more than welcome to pop in and, and, and have a look to, 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 the, to the vineyards and the operations over there. Um, and, you know, we organize regularly tasting inside the vineyards. Uh, so Gosh, this is a little we can part do. of Britain that's about to explode and we're going to get yeah. some lovely Louis Pomeray um, sparkling wine out of it. Yeah, indeed. It's absolutely charming to meet you, Julian. Thank you very you much. Always as well for me. My and, pleasure. Um, Thanks a lot for having me. That's, that, that was my pleasure and, and um, I'm really honoured to have been invited. Oh, thank you very much. So thanks to Julian and Louis Pomeray. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.